Okay, Frederic, you are welcome. Okay. Thank, thank you very much, Daniel, for this very nice, two nice introduction, I would say. It's a real pleasure to, to participate into this colloquium series. And uh, I, I wasn't sure exactly which angle of attack to choose, but finally I decided to give you my view of quantum spin liquids and in, in particular to put the emphasis on uh, actual experimental realization. I still consider myself as a physicist, so trying to understand uh, physical properties of, of systems. And uh, I will not go too deep into the uh, speculative aspects of quantum spin liquids. So I've been, I, uh, so let's see. Oh, it's interesting. I cannot move uh, down. Ah, okay. I don't know what, uh, what happened. So I, I would like for, to, to list, I will not go through all the names of my collaborators. I have collaborated over the years with the several theorists, in particular on the system uh, shown some corroborate about which I will talk, but I've also collaborated a lot with experimentalists, as Daniel said, and uh, this has been extremely fruitful. And to me, this is really important. Uh, the, uh, and uh, our recent work in particular with Henry Crono and Christian Reg was really, really fun. I will briefly mention it at the end of the talk. So I decided there are several ways to speak about quantum spin liquids. One can try to give very abstract definitions. This is not my, my taste. What I decided to do rather is more a historical perspective on quantum spin liquids, because they are really very important uh, uh, first realization of quantum spin liquid. And part of what is happening now is a little bit by chance, in my view, due to high TC superconductors and uh, some ideas, but uh, it all goes back to uh, uh, all, all ideas that were put forward, like spin one half chain uh, 90 years ago, Shastri Sutherland 40 years ago, the Haldane uh, spin one chain conjecture almost 40 years ago. All these are in some sense, uh, 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 realization of quantum spin liquids. And a lot of what we are trying to do these days is either to generalize the uh, ideas of the spin one half chain or of the Haldane chain to larger dimension or to understand the Shastri Savalan model that I will introduce uh, in a minute. Then that was, that, that took place and I would put uh, an end in 87 because then high TC superconductors were discovered. And then quantum spin liquid became very important as maybe uh, uh, the background of superconductivity in high TC superconductors. I will not discuss about high TC superconductors here, but it's really from that, uh, that year onward that new ideas were put forward or really developed like the uh, RVB theory, the RVB spin liquids or algebraic version of two-dimensional spin liquids. And there one of the main aspects that is still ongoing and still not fully satisfactory is to have appropriate uh, experimental realizations of a number of these, uh, these models. I, I, I put here, I will not talk too much about it, but I also put KITAF, the KITAF model on the honeycomb lattice because this is a very interesting model. It is a model of a spin liquid. And uh, more importantly, this is a model that has an exact solution. So that puts this model in a special category as compared to the Kagome, for instance, where, as I will explain, it's still very much up in the air. The difficulty for the Kitaev model is that it requires very anisotropic interactions. And there, the experimental realization is still an ongoing subject. And then for the second part of the talk, and then it will be as long as you wish it to be, I could cut it very much. I would like to concentrate on one particular pair uh, theory and experimental realization that has been, in my view, the most fruitful over the last 20 years, the shastri sutherland model and the compound strontium copper borate. I want to emphasize this because it is extremely important to have a model where one understands enough to be sure about a few things, which is the case with the shastri sutherland model. We don't have an exact solution of the model in, in general, but we have some exact results. And there is a very clean realization of that that makes it very useful because then we can really, uh, we can uh, uh, investigate that, that system and have some uh, very um, fruitful dialogue between theory and experiment. So what I will talk about and I, uh, uh, is mostly, apart from the KITAF model, I will mostly talk about Heisenberg model where we have a lattice of spins and the spins can be uh, one half, one, 
they could even be classical for some purposes. And we have coupling constant between these, uh, these pins. And if we face such a Hamiltonian, by far the most common situation is that there is some kind of uh, helical long range order that develops. And uh, whenever experimentalists uh, or people doing synthesis come up with a compound, most of the time, this is what they will find, some kind of order, a bright peak. So what it means theoretically that the spin-spin correlation does, the function does not decay to zero, but it goes to the square of the order parameter with a, 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 an oscillating factor. And this is the wave vector, the pitch vector of the helical state. So in, uh, uh, in 3D, this would occur up to a certain nail temperature. In 2D, this can occur at zero temperature and in the vast majority of systems synthesized, some kind of order of that type is actually realized at, at, at low temperature. But it's not always the case. And this has been known for a long time. And uh, uh, this is what I will uh, uh, first discuss. The, 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 uh, the first ideas in, in the field. And they, as far as I'm concerned, they are, I, I see it as articulated around basically three models. And the first one is very well known. So I will be fast, but still, I, I think it's important to remember that there, there is the first algebraic spin liquid is actually the first non-trivial quantum mechanical problem ever solved to spin one half Heisenberg chain by Hans Bethe in 1931. And uh, he realized there is a way to find a solution when you take the model I showed before in one dimension with nearest neighbor coupling. And uh, um, if the couplings are antiferromagnetic, then the ground state is, uh, uh, the, well, the beta and that the eigenstates are linear combinations of, it's a very technical thing, but the spin-spin correlation decays algebraically as a power law. So this is really the first example of an algebraic spin liquid. One could say it's a trivial one. It's trivial in the sense that this cannot be easily generalized to two dimension because if we couple such chains in to, to build a two dimensional lattice, we will immediately develop long range order. So it's not something that can be generalized from that point of view, but it has a very important property that the, the, uh, the excitations are fractional. fractional. And, and this is one of the major themes of uh, uh, quantum spin liquids to have some fractional excitations. In the case of spin one half, I'm showing something most of you have seen several times, but in a, in a, in a usual antiferromagnet, if you represent it, that would be a cartoon that would be true in the Ising limit. An excitation would consist into overturning a spin. And uh, that is here, down spin is replaced by an up spin. But this can decay into two domain walls. That is, we can split this by overturning, for instance, these two spins or these two spins. And what we end up with are excitations that are domain walls between antiferromagnetic domains. So here we have an antiferromagnetic domain starting with up, here another one, and we have only two spins up. This is the cartoon picture and more than a cartoon picture in some limit of spin on. This means that the excitation of the spin one half chain are fractional. And uh, one of the consequences is that if one looks at the excitation spectrum, uh, uh, the dynamic, the structure, uh, dynamical structure factors say this, the time, the, the frequency dependent, uh, frequency and momentum dependent spin-spin correlation, it does not have a spin wave mode, but it has a continuum. And this is the theoretical prediction. So this is the continuum that has, of course, more weight uh, uh, towards the bottom, but there is weight everywhere in this region for the two spin on continuum. And these are early experiments from 19... <coughs> from 2003, this is a, a slide I'm, I'm, I'm still using, but this is continuously improved now experimentally. There are more and more realization. So to some extent, the, the first really example of a quantum spin liquid algebraic with, with a fractional excitation is a spin one half chain. And a lot of what we are trying to do is to see whether we can produce such states of matter in higher dimension. And as I said, this is not at all trivial because coupling these systems you are driven immediately to long range order. So it takes something more. There is another model. I will talk a lot about that model, but it was, it appeared, it was almost unnoticed when it appeared. And we, this year we are somehow celebrating the 40th birthday of the Shastri-Sutherland model. 
This is a model of an antiferromagnet where on a square lattice where we have antiferromagnetic couplings between first neighbor that would build a square lattice and we have some diagonal bonds that would have that are another uh, uh, another type of uh, 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 coupling. And what Shastri and Sutherland did were, uh, uh, was to study the phase diagram, the ground state phase diagram of that system. Actually, they did a calculation for various vari values of the spin. Spin one half would be here, and that would be larger values of the spin. And uh, this parameter is just the ratio of the diagonal coupling to this coupling. So if the diagonal coupling is not here, for the classical system, we have nail order, and this remains true for any spin. This is actually proven exactly down to spin one and uh, numerically for spin one half, that there is long range nail order in that limit. But then what they were able to show is that if we in increase this coupling, there has to be a phase transition into a phase where the ground state does not have long range order, but the ground state is actually an exact wave function. This is what makes this model remarkable. It is a product of singlets built on diagonal bonds. And this will actually be true for any, any quantum spin. It's not just spin one half, but this state will be most stable for spin one half here, that would be one over s equal two. It would be less stable increasing the spin. And I think they coined, they were the first at least to use the word quantum spin liquid. I did not write this. This is really taken from their paper 40 years ago. They had this picture with written quantum spin liquid. And that was their definition. It's a quantum spin liquid because the spin-spin correlation does not go to a constant, it decays. And in that case, it decays exponentially. So this model, this is just one, we know one exact thing about this model. It has many other properties that I will discuss towards the end of the talk. What about an experimental realization here? This is what I like about this field. This looks a very improbable uh, lattice, if you think of it. Why the hell would you have a system with uh, only one quarter of the diagonal bonds if you have a symmetry? It turns out that this is the model where we have by far, I think, the most accurate experimental realization in terms of a copper oxide, a layered copper oxide. And uh, this is what I will discuss later on. But this came only after the, the boom of ITC, it was in the 90s. And the, the properties of that compound have been studied over the last 20 years. But to me, I think that's the first appearance of the concept of a quantum spin liquid in the two dimension. And then there is another example, which is uh, again, that has a lot of the current themes in research, which is the spin one half chain. Using field theory argument, I, I hesitated, but I decided not to go over them because that would take me too far. But Haldane suggested that there has to be uh, uh, a difference between half integer and integer spins by writing a field theory, because there would be a topological term in the action that is trivial for integer spins and that is non-trivial for half integer spins. And in his view, the fact that it is, there is a non-trivial phase for the half integer spin explains why they behave the way they do as known from Bete Ansatz. But the absence of any topological term in the action for the spin one chain makes it a trivial example of a system where quantum fluctuations would diverge because we are in 1D. And the way the system copes with this is to open a gap. So there is all the predicted that there has to be a spin gap in the spin one chain. And that came as a big surprise as uh, you, the, the older part of the audience might remember. I think Haldane took everybody by surprise with this paper, all the condensed matter theory community because People thought that since the spin one half chain is algebraic, the larger the spin, the, uh, the more ordered it should be. So it cannot be less ordered, the spin one chain cannot be less ordered than the spin one half chain. Actually, Haldane's first paper was not published in Fuser of Letters, and he got a report saying, okay, this is very nice, but we know the spin one chain has to be algebraic. <laughs> Basically, the kind of belief at that time. So the, the spin, the magnetic community did not believe his result at all. And then, by the same argument, he had mapped his model on a, on a nonlinear sigma model. High energy physicists were totally surprised because they realized that if you have an action with a topological term, this model had been studied in the strong coupling in the weak in the strong coupling regime, and in the strong coupling there is a first order transition. 
But Haldane say, no, at weak coupling, they should be a quantum phase transition and the system should be algebraic. This should be a spin one half chain. And the high energy community was taken totally by surprise by the fact that the nonlinear sigma model with a non trivial topological term is actually gapless and this is the spin one half chain. But, you know, I think uh, th this is really uh, uh, co condensed matter theory at the highest level somehow, because he was really extremely, was against all trends of the field at that time in all, on all field. What I also like about this is that it's again a topological phase. Non-trivial, you know, topology is a big theme these days, and this was not uh, uh, realized immediately by Haldane, but it was more by Kennedy and Tazaki, and there was a very important paper written by Affleck, Kennedy, Lee, Tazaki in 1987, where they had a small modification of the Heisenberg chain with the biquadratic exchange, and they realized that one can write a very simple wave function for the ground state, and this wave function predicts that it has to be unpaired spin one half at the end. So a spin one half chain on a finite system has edge states. And this is one of the definition of topological order. And more and more has been said in the recent years about the spin one chain reinterpreting it in topological language. But the fact of the matter is that this has been known already in 1987. The, the spin one chain has topological properties. It has edge states, which are fractional excitation, spin one half. So in one dimension, we understand a lot of things and somehow everything is there. So now the, the, the question is uh, uh, how to go to higher dimension. But before I do that, let me show that uh, why I chose the date 1987, because that was really the end of one cycle. The, the same year as Affleck Kennedy, Lip Tazaki was the first non-ambiguous evidence of the, of the spin gap in the, uh, uh, in the spin one chain. This is a, uh, a system, a nickel organometallic system with nickel, nickel spin one. This is the, uh, uh, well, that the susceptibility that this is the neutron scattering and this is the dispersion starting from pi and there is a clear gap in the spectrum. So the system has to be gapped. I think that was the first, there, there was some, an, an earlier report, but I think that was the first non-ambiguous evidence. And, uh, what I like about this paper as compared to what, what is done in recent years, you know, where each time you write a paper, you have to solve the problem. Here, the title was presumption for a quantum energy gap, although they had a clear measurement of one milli electron volt here of the, in the spectrum, they had the whole brilliant zone. People at that time were a little bit more modest than they tend to be these days, you know, that's really amazing. I, I like this paper. It's a very nice paper and uh, people were, still concern, have doubts, you know, as researchers and not say, you know, evidence of a quantum energy gap. So I like it. So that was, these were early days before 87. Then came in the uh, high TC superconductors. So that's, uh, that was a big, uh, in the condensed matter community, I think that was a big event, of course, they did discover some, you know, possibility to have such high TC in system that are so poor conductors was came as an enormous surprise and very clearly new ideas were needed to explain this. And among these ideas, a lot of them rotated around the idea that the reason why we have superconductors is that we are doping some kind of spin liquid. So at the very beginning, it was not known that the undoped system is, has long range order, but then this you know, this did not, uh, did not uh, uh, disturb people like Anderson who said, of course, okay, the system, the parent compound is ordered, but when you dope, you change the wave function and what you're doing is really having particle in the spin liquid. So that was an idea. I think extensions of these ideas using variational wave functions seem to be able to explain part of the phase diagram of the high TC. This is not what I want to discuss, but this brought back an idea that was only briefly mentioned in, pay, in a paper by Anderson and Fazekas in 73 for the triangular lattice, the possibility of having, uh, uh, instead of a long range order, to still keep a system that does not break translational symmetry, but uh, is a linear combination of wave functions where each of them has local singles. So the basic idea is that of the resonating valence bond system that was suggested in, for the triangular lattice and essentially proven not to be correct for the triangular lattice. 
but you could take any dimer covering of the triangular lattice, put a singlet there, and make a linear combination of these states to restore the translational symmetry. That, that's, a, that's a cartoon, and there are many difficulties there because the singlet is the system with the sign. So, which sign do you put to the components? They are, it, it, it's tricky. One model that appeared at that time and that played an important role for the RVB theory is the quantum dimer model, where you forget precisely about all these problems, the signs, and you look for a model that just induces. Uh, 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 pro kinetic processes between dimer configurations. And the, this model was put forward by Rockshar and Kivelson in 1988. And this is a, on the square lattice. They studied the square lattice. So you take any dimer covering of the square lattice, and each time you have two dimers facing each other, you have to pay an energy V. When I say pay, it could be positive or negative, actually. But also each time that you have two dimers facing each other, there is a kinetic, process, a kinetic process exchanging the orientation of the dimers on the bracket. So it contains fluctuations in a, in a set of wave functions that uh, uh, with a Hilbert space that corresponds to the dimer coverings. It's a very interesting model. It has an exact, a point where the exact solution is known and there is an isolated point where indeed the sum of all configurations is a ground state. But the problem is that this is not an RVB phase. It's just a point. And at that point, in fact, it was not known at that time of Hochschild Kivelson, but now we know that the dimer dimer correlations decay algebraically. And as soon as one goes away from that point, one develops some kind of long range order. Here is the first order transition to a configuration that is uh, non flippable. And here you develop some kind of order. This phase diagram is still discussed actually, whether one forms plaquettes or immediately columnar phase, or whether there is a mixed phase that uh, does not have C4 symmetry, but still that break the symmetry in this uh, direction. This is still a matter of discussion, but this model is rather academic and maybe not so interesting because it doesn't have an RVB phase. So for some time, that was the end of this idea of uh, uh, RVB in the, some specific model. And there the breakthrough came from a paper by Musner and Sandy in 2001, where they revisited exactly the same model, but on the triangular lattice. It's amazing that it was not done by uh, Hochschild and Kivelson at that time, because that this is because of ITC. They wanted to have it on the square lattice. But this is a very natural extension. And what they realized then is that for that particular model, we have a very similar phase diagram with non-flippable states above the rockshark kivelson point and some kind of plaquette and columnar phase. But in a certain parameter range, there is no long range order. And, uh, uh, this is, and there are exponentially decaying correlations. And uh, uh, this is something that they interpreted as a resonating valence bond phase. And I think this interpretation is true and correct. And that's probably the only lattice model where we have a really strong evidence in, in, uh, in, in favor of such a phase. I actually worked years ago with some colleagues, including Dima Ivanov, on, on, uh, uh, on this model to, to actually prove that this is an RVB phase by putting the system on a torus and checking topological degeneracy. Because again, this phase is a topological phase, like I will show. The thing is the following. If we have dimer coverings and if we have a model with local uh, flipping terms, what we can do is, uh, of course, to change, take a line, consider a geometry of a cylinder, say. So you, we would have a cylinder cutting in this, in this direction. And then if you consider uh, a, a line, we can consider a line here, which would be parallel to the axis of the cylinder and count the number of dimers that cross this line. And in a kinetic process, of course, this number can change, but it can only change by two. So this is, and this is shown here for a process. If we flip this one here, we go from one dimer crossing to three, but you can convince yourself that it's impossible to have only to change it by one. So each time we have a, per, a periodic direction, if we count the dimers perpendicular to that, we will have two sectors 
two topological sectors depending on the parity on the number of the number of dimers. And if we are on a torus, we have two sectors in two directions. So we have four sectors. So that's one of the prediction of the resonating valence bond spin liquid, that it should be a topological state that should have non-trivial properties as, as usual to reveal the properties. One, one thing is to look at the uh, degeneracy of the state on a surface that has a non-trivial topology. This is, all these ideas are actually borrowed from the quantum Hall effect. Where the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the degeneracy of the states is best seen on a torus. And here that's the same. And we could prove numerically by studying the system in different sectors that there is indeed such a, such a, degener a topological degeneracy. So that's a model, but okay, we, we'll come to it later, but this quantum dimer model as it is, has no, is the connection to a, a quantum magnets is not completely obvious. I will come back to it before, but before I will discuss another of the ideas about spin liquid, that came from high TC uh, research, which is algebraic spin liquids in 2D. I, I will be very brief because I could, it could be an entire talk to properly define these things. But I think the, uh, again, the basic ideas have been laid for the, these systems very immediately after the discovery of high TC superconductors. And there were two, two versions of it, two papers. There was one paper by Kalmeyer and Laughlin where they wrote a, boson, a bosonic version of the quantum hole, the quantum hole state. That is, uh, for fermionic, for fermions, you know, if you look at the Laughlin wave function, the prefactor should be an odd power of zi minus zj because of the anti-symmetry of the wave function. The bosonic wave function could have would have an even power of zi minus zj, but it would still be a, 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 uh, a system, a topological system. And why they suggested is that this could be a ground state of the Kagome antiferromagnet, this wave function. It's not believed to be the case, at least not for the plane wave Kagome antiferromagnet, but that was a very interesting uh, uh, proposal that one might have in, uh, uh, for spin systems, a system which is gapped like a quantum hole state and uh, uh, but that has a non-trivial topological properties. And research in trying to come up with examples of this is still going on. Another, still yet another idea, which has to do with uh, uh, sp uh, spin liquids with fermionic wave function is the, uh, was proposed by Affleck and Marston in 1988. It was, the, it was the pi flux state of fermions. So one can write wave functions for fermions and uh, one can have fermions circulate on the lattice if it is on the honeycomb lattice, we would have Dirac points. If it is on the square lattice, remember this is about high TC, so they want it to be on the square lattice, but they realized that if there is a pi flux per plaquette for the fermions hopping around a plaquette, they can have Dirac, Dirac uh, uh, points. And then if one use this wave function to write down a proper wave function for a spin model by imposing on top of it a gut filler projection to ensure that one has one particle per site. This is a well-defined wave function. And that was a wave function that they suggested for the square lattice antiferromagnet. This wave function would have algebraic correlation. So this would be the proper generalization in some sense of the speedman half Heisenberg chain. All these were ideas that was really a very, uh, and a very exciting period. So people could go with very original ideas, RVB, Carroll spin liquid, and etc. Now, the problem is, do we know realistic parent Hamiltonians or realizations? And th that's a major, major uh, uh, problem or theme of research still these days. Uh, uh, sorry, I pressed the wrong button. And at that time, the system that has uh, 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 crystallized all these proposals is the Kagome spin one half antiferromagnet. I think this is a model. So this is the Heisenberg model. The Kagome uh, lattice is shown here and the, the, the plain vanilla version of the model just has antiferromagnetic couplings between the spins. And I think this is really the lattice for which everything has been proposed. I think all these spin liquids are candid. And uh, uh, so let me say a few words about it. This is a really fascinating model. Classically, it is extremely degenerate. So <clears throat> to, to show it, just to give you an idea, if you're not familiar with it, of how degenerate it is, 
If you consider only coplanar configurations where all spins lie in the plane of the, of the screen here, we already have an infinite degeneracy because the degeneracy then once we fixed say one triangle, so then all we, we uh, um, all other uh, uh, spins for the plane have to be, have, have the same degeneracy as the three state pots model. That is, if we choose these spins here, if it's red, this means that here we have a green and yellow or the other way around. And this has a, a residual entropy. So already the number of coplanar configurations is a, a, a coplanar ground state is infinite. But more than that, we can create non coplanar states. For instance, here, this configuration is kind of random, but not totally, I've chosen a configuration where around all the spins here, we are surrounded by spins in the same direction, the, the green spin here. Then this means that we can satisfy the constraint that we have the sum of the spin zero on each triangle, which is for the Heisenberg model, the constraint to be satisfied to minimize the classical energy. We can rotate all the spins inside around the direction of the green spin going out of the screen. And this can be done in many parts of the system. It can be done with loops of, of, of uh, say, up spins here. If we have rows of up spins, we can also do it <clears throat> between these rows. So the classical ground state of the Kagome is extremely degenerate with continuous, uh, uh, it's not just a residual entropy, but we have continuous parameters describing this degeneracy. So quantum mechanically, it looks like uh, it, it, it looks plausible that uh, it, the system will have a hard time to order. You know, one of the theme in frustrated magnetism is order by disorder. Quantum fluctuations can, under certain circumstances, develop a, a order in a system that classically would be disordered. But here, there are so many candidates, it doesn't look likely. And in fact, we don't believe it's uh, the case, at least for spin one half. It could be the case for larger spins. So, First of all, for that system, we have a, 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 a almost perfect, a good realization of that model. So one could think that because of this, that would be the end of the story, but unfortunately it's not because the system is not perfect enough. The compound, the best realization of the spin one half Kagome is that system here. So it's a copper, the spins one half are carried by copper. It's a mineral, so that's why you have the name of Herbert Smith, who uh, discovered it, and uh, uh, Herbert Smithite. And uh, it's uh, um, the copper atoms are arranged in planes, and uh, these Kagome planes are separated by zinc, triangular zinc planes. So th this works well because zinc and copper are compatible. They are both uh, uh, two plus, the, val the formal valence. And uh, uh, for that system, what we know, uh, uh, well, there was a number of experiments, but there was an, an, an important paper in, in 2012 showing with uh, uh, neutron scattering that there was very broad scattering. So that, that, that's, uh, uh, that would be a, 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 a pass, a cut through a pass uh, uh, in the uh, reciprocal space. I'm not going to give you details, but it doesn't look at all like uh, uh, we, uh, we have, we have neither a long range order nor well-defined excitations. It looks very broad. And uh, um, so th that's a good sign. The difficulty came when looking at uh, uh, trying to be more specific about whether the system has a gap or not. Neutron scattering is enabled to, to, to look at very low uh, energy here. And the first set of experiments done in the group of uh, Takashi Imai in McMaster in 2015 came to the conclusion that the spectrum is gapped. But later on, this conclusion was <coughs> not confirmed, but um, contradicted by the group of Philip Mendels, again doing NMR. And uh, in both cases, I think it was uh, oxygen NMR, finding that it's gapless. And this is where we reach the kind of problem we have with the Kagome, both experimentally and theoretically, that it's very difficult to have convergent experimental results. Let me, uh, before I, I switch to theory, just a few words about here, the Herbert Smithite. There are two problems there in that system that make it not a perfect spin one half Kagome. One of them is exchange between zinc and copper. 
Zinc and copper are ions that have very pretty much the same magnitude. So it's very difficult to build structure. And even if it is stoichiometric to make sure that there is no exchange between copper and zinc. So this is one thing Philip Mendels, I think, believed that he's able, he see different lines depending on the environment. So he believes he's still able to look at the property of the system away from such defects. And the other problem, which is intrinsic to Kagome, is, and maybe it's better for that purpose to look at here, is that no bond of the Kagome antiferromagnet can be central symmetric. To avoid, you know, uh, uh, anti-symmetric interaction, jaroszynski moria interaction, to make sure that they are not present, a bond should be, uh, there should be an inversion at the center of the bond. And for the Kagome, there is none because this side here has no partner here. So the system is, has to have jaroszynski moria interaction. And it is known that jaroszynski moria interaction, just a few percent, 10, eight or 10% change the nature of the, uh, of the system and order the system. So it's very tricky experimentally. And I think there is still room for better realization of the spinman half kagome to give a better confirmation. And if we look at theory, the situation is also confusing. It's, well, I will skip the first few years where, well, even people like me, I suggested it's an RVB spin liquid. And then there were a series of papers, <coughs> again, uh, uh, well, some of them really claiming to have found the solution. The first paper was a variational wave function suggested that it, it is an example of an algebraic spin liquid. One should, one, the wave function would be fermions on the Kagome antiferromagnet with a pi flux per hexagonal plaquette projected. And they suggested that this is a good approximation to the ground state. This was not confirmed by DMRG investigation by Jan, Hughes, and uh, White who found that there is a gap in the system and they interpreted their results as uh, evidence for uh, an RVB spin liquid. And this remained the truth of the Kagome until 2016. And if you look at the paper, the NMR paper that found a gap, this paper was published in 2015. So that was at the time where theory had suggested that uh, the, uh, uh, the system had, uh, uh, had a gap. But then other uh, uh, approaches, a tensor network approach by uh, Tao Chang in, uh, in Beijing collaborators, again found evident that it is indeed an algebraic spin liquid as first proposed by Li. So this is completely different. It's not a variational wave function. This is really another type of approach. I will not dwell on it, but it's, it's a system that builds on uh, quantum information concepts to generalize DMRG, which is a 1D technique, to two dimension. And it gives rather impressive results on a number of models in 2D. And they got, and they again found that it's algebraic. And Polman then and collaborators revisited the DMRG approach, but realized that with the boundary conditions, uh, they, it, this is very tricky. And they came to the conclusion that it is indeed an algebraic spin liquid. So what, what is my take at it? Okay, we have evidence both in favor or against the gap, but the most recent result by Philippe Mendels, I, I think this is very uh, thorough in, uh, interpretation of NMR data. He points to a, a, a gapless system. The most recent uh, uh, numerical results point to an algebraic spin liquid. So maybe that's the solution. I personally, but I, I'm, I'm, you know, there maybe I'm a, <laughs> I'm a, a member of a minority, I should warn you. I, I am still skeptical. And uh, the reason is not my own results. The reason are old results by uh, the group of Claire Lullier, exact diagonalization of the spin one half Kagome antiferromagnet, published in the late 90s. This is, at, you know, for within its uh, boundaries at the limits, this result is is exact. It is Langshaw's exact diagonalization. They put the system on uh, uh, the Kagome on a torus with 36 sites, and they look at all the excitation spectrum using, uh, using Langshaw's. And what they found is that the spectrum is very, and uh, very peculiar, very unusual, because there are 183 singlets before the first triplet in the system. 
that was to me the motivation of my own RVB theory, because RVB, if you have fluctuations between dimers, all this leaves in the singlet sector. There are almost 200 singlets. If you take an antiferon magnet, like the square lattice, the first excitation is a triplet. So it's absolutely different. And this is very solid, you know, you cannot, it's, uh, and uh, this proliferation of singlets is not at all typical of an algebraic spin liquid. In an algebraic spin liquids, they are both low-lying singlet and triplet excitations in the same energy range. So I don't know, to me that's, you know, I took this for an inconvenient truth from what Al Gore, you know, the guy going around with the uh, about, uh, environmental issues saying we, we, we tend to ignore things that we don't know how to fit in the picture. For the Kagomer, this is the way I feel, you know, everything seems to be in favor of having a large break spin liquid, it's the current understanding and uh, it fits. But we, we have this problem, nobody has an explanation for that. Whoever, or all of my colleagues coming up with this suggestion or prove that it's an algebraic spin liquid, I keep asking them, can you, but could, could you at least try? I think some of them are, are really trying to see whether they can understand these results by Claire Lullier as a finite size effect. And maybe it's only much for much larger system that uh, the, the finally magnetic excitations come into play, but uh, it's very strange. So to me, the Kagome spin one half is not solved. And I, I really, I think the progress will be made if one day people can come up with a compound, which is really a, a, a very good realization. And this might be with a more synthetic methods like cold atoms, because the presence of DM interaction, dimensional interaction is, is in any way a big problem experimentally. So another model, I will go very fast, but another interesting model was the J1J2 model uh, on the square lattice that was put forward by Premi Chandra and Benoit Dussault again in 1988, in these very interesting years of uh, where everything could be proposed. So they look at this model and uh, they did a spin wave calculation and realized that between a nail order and some kind of helical order with a, a collinear arrangement, quantum fluctuations should destroy long range order and they should be a spin liquid. It's a very interesting, simple proposal. I like this paper very much because it contains a lot of these ideas of about quantum spin liquids. It's an extremely difficult problem again. That's really one, one of the difficulty, one of the messages. You know, this, this model has been studied for 33 years now, theoretically, and uh, uh, by all kinds of methods spin waves, stringer bosons, exact diagonalizations, financial Monte Carlo, series expansion, tensor networks, and the ground state phase diagram is still debated. I think nobody, so that's one example that is, you know, the, uh, the counter, that is the, the opposite of those guys who measure the Haldane gap, Haldane gap, you know, and said presumption of the Haldane gap. This model has been solved several times every year, for 33 years. No, the solution of the J1, J2, and, and still it's contradicted. So I will not, maybe among all these proposals, the solution is there, but it hasn't been proven, I would say, with a reasonable accuracy. The problem is really to know. I think most people would agree. I think it's clear that there is a phase that has no long range magnetic order, but whether it is an RVB phase or whether it's a, a some kind of columnar order, like in the quantum diamond model, I, I think it's not, uh, there is the, all, all the work has not converged yet. So it's very difficult. And again, as far as experiments are concerned, we are in a better situation than with, with Kagome here, because the, this model, in this model, the bonds are naturally central symmetric. So in compounds having this kind of structure, we could have very weak anisotropic interactions, but the Dallas-Kimoria should not be there. So that's better. The problem is that the window of parameter here is very narrow. So I think it's improving and I'm not sure to be totally up to date in that respect, but the, uh, uh, the first system that, was, uh, that has this J1, J2 model, I mean, I, I, that was done with, uh, when I was still uh, at CNRS in Toulouse with a chemist friend, uh, Patrice Millet, we, we, we came up, he came up with a, 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 this uh, system, which is Vanadium system. And the, the, the compound here was uh, uh, with the uh, uh, silicon and germanium. 
And this built a J1, J2 lattice, but it was in the limit where J2 was much bigger than J1 because the, of the symmetry of the uh, copper orbitals, 3D orbitals. But then this has, I didn't follow up on this, and I, but uh, all other people did. And now there is a whole family of compounds, uh, mostly vanadium compounds, that start to, to, to build, you know, to probe this phase diagram. So this slide is, or is maybe already one or two years uh, old. There, there are some recent papers I had no time to study in detail, but it could be that now they start to be some, some models having parameters in the range where we would expect some kind of spin liquid. The, the, the difficulty there is um, that this phase is very narrow and interlayer coupling, for instance, uh, that is present in the layered structure could be sufficient to drive the system away from the spin liquid. So it's a very, again, a very interesting model, very difficult. We don't know its properties for sure, and we don't know good realizations. And uh, well, this will be the end of my introduction with Kitai. I will go very, very briefly on this. In that respect, Kitayev model on the honeycomb lattice, which is written here, it's not a Heisenberg model. It's a model living on the honeycomb lattice where we have spin one half operators, but on each bond, the coupling is in another direction. On, on one type of bond, it's in the X, it's the X component of the Pauli matrix, in the other Y, and in, in the third direction Z. So this model is very far from a Heisenberg model, but Kitaev quite amazingly found a, a beautiful solution to that model. Return in terms not of three but four Majorana Fermion. It's like this solution. I don't know how he came to this idea. It's it's really a brilliant solution. Anyway, he's a brilliant guy, no doubt. And uh, uh, there is a solution to that model. So this puts it in a much better situation than systems like Kagome or J1J2, where one is still debating about the physics. And there, there is a, co a complicated phase diagram as a function of the various couplings, and there are gapped phases in the system when one of the coupling uh, dominates over the other two. And uh, there is a gapless phase inside. But if one puts the system in a field for the gapless phase, again, when one reopens a gap, and all these phases are topological. And I uh, will not enter the details. There are, they could be, uh, if there are, we are in a gap phase, there would be uh, uh, anions, so that is excitations like in the quantum Hall effect, but they would be abelian meaning that if one, uh, one excitation goes around the other one, it just picks up a phase. But in the gapless phase in a field, there would be non-abelian anions, meaning that if we try to exchange particles, in fact, what we do is to, we have a degenerate ground state and we create linear combinations. So it's a matrix acting in the ground state manifold, not just a phase. And that would be, if, True, I mean, th this is what people working, for instance, in the quantum Hall effect are after, because such excitations would be necessary to implement some gates for quantum computer. So that would be very important. This model looks very, rather unphysical, at least from the point of view of spin one half, but maybe it's not so irrealistic. And uh, this was actually realized by uh, John Jacqueli and uh, Gilead Kaliulin in 2009. Uh, in a very interesting paper where they realized that if one goes to system with a very strong spin orbit coupling and in a certain geometry, it is actually possible to generate a system on the honeycomb lattice that has a contribution that has exactly the symmetry of the Kitayev model. And so if uh, uh, that, that, that's you know, a minimal model for this system, so there is always the Heisenberg component, but there is also a Kitaev component. And uh, uh, there are two candidates the, 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 that have been discussed. One is the an iridium oxide. The other one that looks maybe more promising now is the alpha phase of ruthenium chloride, where maybe this term is small enough that we can see some traces of the, uh, 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 of the physics of the Kitaev model here. I, again, I, I'm not uh, myself working there. I'm not maybe aware of the very last developments, but what I saw on, in, in recent talks on the ruthenium chloride and the alpha phase is that there is an, a phase that, that is uh, sufficiently strange in magnetic field and that might indeed be uh, 
uh, some kind of spin liquid. So all, all this to say that apart from this spin one half chain or Haldane chain, it's always quite difficult to find systems where theory and experiment, a model that is well understood and compound match each other. And then I will go back now to uh, the Shastri settlement. And uh, now the uh, chairman has to tell me how much time I have because I can speak five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes. It's a little bit up to you. Uh, what uh, uh, you, you have to tell me if you have a strict limit, I could almost- No, no, no. Uh, we don't have a strict limit. Probably 10 minutes is fine. Yeah. Okay, let me give you a flavor because this system that was this model that was put forward 40 years ago turns out to have an experimental realization. Excellent. That was discovered only 10 years later, 1991, by people in Oregon, by chemists. And uh, uh, I, let me show you a better picture of this uh, structure. This is a copper oxide, where copper in red here occupy uh, the uh, form an orthogonal dimer lattice. That is, each dimer is orthogonal to its four neighbor dimers. The system has copper two plus, it's a spin one half. And then looking at this geometry, we have two dominant couplings, the coupling along the bond, J, which is known to be about 85 Kelvin, and the coupling between the copper, between two dimers, which has a ratio of, of about 0 0.63 of the main coupling. And it turns out that this is an exact, topologically exactly equivalent to the shastri Savalan model. That is, the, uh, if you pull a little bit on the lattice, if this bond is getting longer, at some point you hit exactly the shastri Savalan model. And this model has in common with the shastri Savalan model that the, uh, 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 the ground state, if this bond is strong enough, or the ground state is an exact product of singlets on these bonds. And well, it was not known at that time, Shastri Sutherland had an, uh, 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 an upper bound to this coupling, but it turns out that the coupling here of J prime over J is small, that is the strong coupling is on the dimer and the critical value above which the dimer product of dimers uh, singlets disappear is 0 0.675. So this compound, is, is, it's amazing, it, exactly where it should be. It is on the right side for the ground state to be a product of singlets, but not too deep in that phase that we can actually play with this parameter. It's, it's truly remarkable. It's, it's, a, it's really a, 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 almost a miracle. So this system, if it has a ground state of singlets, should have a spin gap. And one way to measure the spin gap is at zero temperature, to put the system in a magnetic field, because it will take, if there is a spin gap, this means the triplet is at a distance and it will take a certain magnetic field to close the single triplet gap. And this triggered the investigation of this first as an example of spin gap. <coughs> and what people discovered is that, and this was the first paper and uh, uh, with a number of uh, famous people like Charles Slichter here, and, uh, uh, they realized that indeed there is no magnetization up to a certain field. You know, this is, these are uh, uh, pulse field experiments, so it's not very precise, but there are other anomalies. And these anomalies, they already interpreted on the basis of this data as magnetization plateaus. That was very brave and that turned out to be correct. The system, because of frustration, has uh, uh, developed a number of magnetization plateaus. I will go briefly so the one over eight around 30 tesla uh, there is here something but with these experiments you don't know what happens whether you break the symmetry so the first experiments that proved this was an nmr experiment done uh, by collaboration with uh, between uh, Masashi takigawa and uh, claude berthier from uh, isp tokyo and from grenoble and uh, uh, what they realized this is the copper spectrum just below the plateau and when you enter this intermediate phase, the copper spectrum is very rich. And this is very typical of a system that has many copper sites. And so this means that you have plateaus where you break translational symmetry. I go fast because I, 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 I want. And then the, the investigation of plateaus in that system has continued and more plateaus have been found. 
plateau at one third. Plateau at one half, this was the world record that time. In this paper in 2012, they managed to go over the 100 Tesla psychological barrier here, and they found a one half plateau. It's, uh, so this compound really triggered very interesting experiment. They forced people to go at the limit of what they can do, experimentally. And then uh, the uh, lower part of the magnetization curve was revisited and more plateaus were found. There is not only one over eight, but two over 15 and one over six. So there are many plateaus and this was further confirmed. I, I go a little bit fast. The current status is that this system has a series of magnetization plateaus, which look very improbable. You, if you try numerology, it, it's a, there is no simple rule to explain why these plateaus and why not other plateaus. The, all these plateaus are believed to break translational symmetry. What is the theory? This turned out to be quite difficult. We're not sure yet, but we, uh, uh, the basic idea of why plateau is very simple. We have a geometry where dimers are orthogonal. So if we put a triplet here, it has an amplitude a zero probability to jump here if we have a singlet, because putting a singlet here gives an eigenstate of this because of the interferences. This is the same argument as why, in the first place, the product of dimer singlets is the ground state. And so we, <coughs> we expect for the, the, the triplets in that system to have a very small kinetic energy, but they have a repulsion. If you put two triplets here, they really have a strong repulsion. So the frustration is reducing the hopping as compared to the normal situation, but it's not reducing the repulsion. So that was the basic idea that we should have crystals of triplets and that we have metal insulated transitions. This was believed to be the case for years and uh, uh, some phenomenological papers uh, had some series of plateaus, some more systematic models were, uh, 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 investigations were done. These were by uh, uh, colleagues in Toulouse, former colleagues in Toulouse. We did also something in, in, uh, in uh, perturbation theory. The problem is we never found the right sequence. If you look at the sequence of plateaus we have, we never found the one eight here or the one quarter. There was something fishy about all these studies. We, we were, we were a little bit, uh, we were very puzzled until 2014, where uh, uh, I think Philippe Corbeau, yes, he was maybe a postdoc, or he had been a postdoc in my group. Philippe Corbeau is uh, an, an expert of this new approach, tensor networks. So he had a new look at the system and he realized that we had been on the wrong tracks for, for uh, 14 years, 15 years to explain these plateaus. Because we've been looking for crystal of triplets uh, transforming a singlet to a triplet. But in reality, the system is a Wigner crystal of spin two bound states. These triplets form bound states, and this is what he found. And in terms of these bound states, the sequence of plateau becomes very natural. Because you have these bound states, you try to put them on a square lattice at a certain distance. The two over 15 has a huge unit cell because the bound states rotate with respect to each other, but it's a very natural state. And they had a series of plateaus, very natural. There is a one fifth plateau, which is not observed in experiment, but turns out that this plateau would be destroyed, would be very sensitive to DM interactions. So maybe that's the reason. So anyway, that was the first surprise. And the current proposal is that these low magnetization plateaus are crystals of bound states. This requires now further experimental investigation because to make sure of this, we would need diffraction experiments, probing the actual wave vector of the structure. And this turns out to be extremely difficult because the, 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 the moment is scattered over a big unit cell. So it's a very small sensitivity. Two experiments have, have been tried. And uh, well, actually three, including one with X-ray and two with neutrons. And none of them has been able to see anything. That is, they do not, they did not confirm or, or disprove our proposal. It's just at the moment still below what can be observed. No, not that it, notice that it, it's, these are difficult experiments because they take place, if we look here, you have to reach for the one over eight plateau, 27 Tesla. So you, you want to do experiments in 27 Tesla. It, it is not possible to have neutron scattering 
or X-ray scattering at facilities where we have steady fields, like in Tallahassee or in Nijmegen or in Grenoble, you uh, um, the the uh, all all what uh, you can do is to have a pulsed field. So in in Berlin they had some experiments where they could go up to twenty six tesla in a, in a static field. Some experiments have been done, but this experiment has been dismantled one year after the magnetic field was installed. So there is, I think, still not fully explored data at twenty six tesla in in under pressure to try to reduce the plateau, but it's, it's very difficult. I'm in contact with many experimentalists trying to have this. Where, how I'm doing with time? Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm <coughs> really behind schedule. So I think I will skip or will just flash part of the, uh, the remaining story. The, the system is bizarre because between the dimer phase and the nail phase, there is an inter intermediate plaquette phase. That's true in the Shastri Sutherland. This would be the structure, nail order, dimer, and in between some phase that uh, stabilize plaquettes. I show this one because we have the precise, uh, um, the precise uh, uh, value. And again, experiments, it's very interesting dialogue, experiments confirm this, that there is an intermediate phase, but they came to a conclusion that it's not the one predicted by theory. So we have a problem there. That was first experiments done by Takigawa and uh, they came with the idea that in this intermediate phase, or not idea, they came with a result, they came up with a result that there are two different copper sites. And if we were in this plaquette phase, all copper sites are equivalent. So it cannot be that one. And this was further confirmed in a paper by my colleague, uh, Henry Crono, where they did uh, neutron scattering. And the form factor was not consistent with having plaquettes on the empty plaquette. And so they suggested that it could be that phase. Why? This phase is stabilized, we don't know. Could be some residual interactions such as interlayer coupling. It could also be that because of the uh, spin lattice coupling, there is a distortion. And in fact, what we showed is that uh, uh, it takes a very small distortion to stabilize this phase. But there is an intermediate plaquet phase that's important. And there is a first order transition between the two, the two phases experimentally here. And uh, the plaquette phase was also confirmed in thermodynamic experiments very recently, where a peak upon entering the plaquette phase was observed here <coughs> at around two Kelvin. So there, there is an intermediate phase in that system. And that was the trace where the specific, there is a maximum of the specific heat. And this is the last thing I'm going to discuss now, because there is something very interesting happening there, as we found out. Uh, I skip a few things about the, uh, 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 the phase and the phase diagram, how to stabilize this phase. I just a word, the fact that this system has been predicted to have topological magnons in a small field. And that could be again, a topological property of the system that was shown by Judith Romani and collaborators. If you put a field, you can create magnon bonds with non-trivial churn numbers. And this will produce edge states that could be measured in, uh, appeared in the thermal conductivity experiments. The band structure has been confirmed by neutrons, but not the, the, the edge properties not, have not been confirmed by uh, thermal uh, measurements. This I can skip. The plaquette antiferromagnetic transition is suggested maybe to be a deconfined critical point. And I will come to the last thing, last work we did on the system. And if you give me three more minutes, so that will be it. We saw that there is a first order transition between the dimer phase and the plaquette phase. And uh, uh, according to these experiments by uh, the Chinese group and by Anders Sandvik, this transition, there is a an clear transition at two Kelvin and there is a maximum of specific heat here. And this transition we know should be first order. So what happens then? How do we connect the fact that we have a first order transition with an Ising transition here? One possibility would be that the first order transition ends up at a, a point, becomes an Ising transition at the tricritical Ising point. That would be one scenario. The other possibility is that this first order transition goes up. The Ising transition just touches this line. There is no problem with this from the point of view of general principle of statistical mechanics and transition. 
But then if there is a first order transition, it should end up at a critical point. This like, like in water, when the water boils at a certain pressure, there is a critical point and we can go around. And this we had observed this type of uh, property in another model. And so when uh, Henry Crono came to me uh, two years ago, he had very similar data to the data ob obtained for the specific heat. These are their data. So this is a color map of the specific heat as a function of pressure. They saw again a transition around two Kelvin, that would be the transition into the plaquette phase. But the specific heat data had a peak that was very pronounced here. It was not just a broad maximum, but at certain point, the specific heat here was becoming very large. In fact, if we look at the data, the, the left part here are the data, the, last, the right part is theory. If we look at the data, at, at low pressure, 15, 16, there is a broad maximum of the specific heat. At 18.2 kilobars, the specific heat becomes very big. And at around 20 kilobar, there is really a very clear and narrow peak in the specific heat. And at larger pressure, it disappears completely. So looking at these data, at their phase value, in the phase diagram, there seems to be one point where there is really a divergence of the specific heat. And, but then we knew that here at zero temperature, there has to be a first order transition between the dimer phase and the plaquette phase. So the idea was what happened probably is that this point is actually a critical point. It is the termination of a first order transition between the, uh, uh, the dimer phase and the plaquette phase. And uh, uh, well, that was just an idea, but then to support this idea, we, uh, uh, Philippe Corbeau again was able to do some uh, IPEDS calculation to calculate the specific heat of the system, mimicking the pressure with an increased ratio J prime, uh, J over J prime of the interdimer coupling. And, and the, uh, um, the numerical results are in, in rather good agreement with the experimental result. And there for the, is, for the theory, we have a peak here if we look at the same parameters, we develop a peak, but it's very clear that this is really a single point. That is, we could <coughs> really narrow the point and look, for instance, at the correlation length and the correlation length diverges at a single point. So we believe that we have observed here in that system a critical point similar to water that terminates the first order transition. So that would be that the three-dimensional version of this phase diagram where we have added the magnetic field because we also have evidence that this critical point evolves in a critical line because at the magnetic field, we still keep a first order transition. But as far as we know, this was really an uh, unexpected and maybe a first observation of uh, uh, a critical point terminating a line of first order transition in the context of quantum antiferromagnets. So to summarize the part of the strontium copper borage, I, I've worked on that system for 20 years. And to me, it's the most interesting quantum magnets ever synthesized. This is of course biased because I'm interested, but still when you look at all the properties, though that I showed and though that I didn't show, I think one lesson for me is a good, very well characterized sample is really a miracle of nature. So one has to really continue to study that one. And new things are, each time we try to measure something, we find some new interest in physics there. More generally in quantum magnetism, it's a remarkably rich subfield of strongly correlated systems. And uh, really there is room for lots of discoveries. I, I hope I conveyed the message that this is by far not a, a fully understood field in no way. Simple models, Kagome, J1, J2, are still under debate, not fully understood. Good experimental realizations are still missing. So I hope some of you, I, I, if I can motivate or conform to some of you in the idea that they are worth studying, I, I, I will have done my job. Thank you for your attention.